I don't know why I was chosen to give this talk. Get the first. Hard for me to imagine it was 30 years since I finished my residency. And just like you, there's certain attendings and things that they said to me that I'll never forget. One of my uh, mentors and favorite uh, teachers was Dr. Ashby Moncure. He was a surgeon's surgeon. He did GI surgery, thoracic surgery, and vascular surgery. I probably glommed on to him because he's a huge sports fan and competitive as hell, just like me. I'll never forget, I was on call Thanksgiving. Guy came in with a small bowel obstruction. I think it was after dinner, <clears throat> and I did the case with Ashby. And I said, uh, gee, Dr. Moncure, how was your Thanksgiving? And he said, it was great. Great. Well, Dr. Moncure, what was so great about it? We had the turkey bowl. I won. 15-1. 15-2, 15-1. It's a turkey bowl. Squash tournament. Said, Gee, Dr. Moncure, it's Thanksgiving. Couldn't you have eased up in that third set a little bit? And he looked at me, and he dropped his instruments on the field, and with his cold gray eyes, he said, Ratner, surgeon doesn't walk on the court to lose. And we finished that case in absolute silence. But I was still his resident a few more weeks, and I remember also doing a very difficult fem pop bypass with him for limb salvage. And we fussed and fussed, and he didn't like the anastomosis, and we redid it. Seemed pretty good. And as I was leaving and made my rounds that night, I went to see the patient, and damn it, his foot was cool, his pulse was gone, and I had to call Dr. Moncure. I don't think he was going to be too happy, so I called him up and I said, hey, Dr. Moncure, Hate to bother you, but I think the graft went down. He paused and said, Ratner, that's a damn problem with vascular surgery. You can do everything right, and sometimes it doesn't work. I said, do you want to take him back? He said, probably not going to work, but we better do it. The family will appreciate it, even if he does lose his leg. And so we did, and I learned a really valuable lesson from Dr. Moncure that night, and that was a family doesn't necessarily expect you to be perfect, but they do expect you to be all in and fully invested in the care. Well, obviously I got a little older, my practice matured, and I was in my office, a guy came to see me for GERD and repair of his hiatal hernia, and I got to talking to him. And he'd been sent by Dr. Moncure himself and told me that Dr. Moncure had told him with this new minimally invasive surgery it was going to be a breeze and I'd get rid of his heartburn. I don't remember all of it, but he did have pretty typical GERD and his testing was okay. Maybe he was a little on the heavy side. I did his case. In those days, I don't remember whether I was pledging my sutures or not. And I think might have been before the days of the harmonic scalpel. I can't really remember all the details, but suffice it to say, the guy came back to the office, seemed fine, and never heard from him again till last summer. And I was uh, playing in a golf tournament with Matt Hutter, and we played at Dr. Moncure's old club, actually. And after we finished our round, we were having a beer, sort of telling some war stories. This big guy comes over and puts his hand on my back. He goes, hey, doc, you remember me? You fixed my hiatal hernia. I looked at him and said, oh, yeah, sure. I, I recognize you. How you doing? By the <laughs> then these three other buddies came over. And of course, uh, my buddy uh, Aunt Hutter here, he, he's not afraid to have a second round of drinks. So we had a few more. <laughs> Conversation got going. And then I made a fatal error. And I asked him how he felt. He said, you know, I felt good for a while, but I started to get a little heartburn, and then I got a little bit more. And my wife started to tell me I was snoring a lot at night, said I was drinking too much. But I don't really think that was the case. I'm on this medicine now, and it, it helps a little bit, but it sure as hell is expensive. And his friend said, yeah, why don't you get to the doc to give you your money back and pay for that? 
So they walked off. And I sat there. I was really sort of humiliated. I was embarrassed. I mean, did Dr. Moncure know? I mean, what about his referring physician? I mean, and, and after all, I mean, I'm a big Harvard professor, and shouldn't I have been able to deliver a better result than that? Well, I, I got over it. You know, I went back to work, and things were sort of poking along. And one night, I came up to the, uh, my office after work, and usually there's a stack of messages and phone calls. And I saw one that sort of caught my attention. It said, Mr. Williams, concerned about an operation you did on him. Now, I don't know about you. But that's usually not a happy phone call. So I did the rest of the messages. I left it to last, and I called. <clears throat> and it turned out it was a guy from the golf club. And he said, listen, it was, I'm sorry if I was a little out of line at, at the golf tournament the other day. But seeing you made me think about how good I felt when your operation was working. And I just, do you ever get a chance, a second chance at these operations? I mean, is that possible? <laughs> I mean, that wasn't really what I was expecting when I made that phone call, but I said, sure. Why don't you come on in, and, and we'll take a look at you. So about 10 days later, I was in clinic and running through my list, and I see the guy's name there, Williams. And before I walked into the room, I sort of ran through my little checklist of, you know, what had gone wrong, you know, what about the operation? Was this guy going to be a candidate for a redo? What am I going to do differently? So I walked in and talked to him. And, it was quite a different guy than the sweaty guy I'd met at the golf course. This guy was dressed in a three-piece suit, looked very distinguished and articulate. We told a few stories about our mutual friend, Dr. Moncure, and after talking to him for a while, I realized there was no one thing I could pinpoint that caused his fundoplication to fail. You know, he had put on a little weight, and you know, maybe his wife was right. Maybe he was drinking a little bit more than he admitted to, but nothing really in particular. So I went into my usual speech for people with a failed anti-reflux operation. I told them how dangerous and difficult the redo was, and he really may not be the best choice for you. And I, let's just do a little bit better on the medical management. And uh, what I want you to do, I want you to eat your dinner a little bit earlier. And then when you do get into bed, make sure the head of your bed's up on some blocks. That'll help with your reflux. And, and by the way, uh, no more red wine, no coffee. Uh, so I cut down on the fatty foods. And, and by the way, if you can lose a few pounds, that, that'll help you too, Mr. Williams. <laughs> he did not give me a very nice look, I can tell you. And he said, Doc, I've worked hard my whole life. I'm a man of means now, and I intend to enjoy my golden years. And what you're asking me to do is no fun at all. I came here to ask you to redo my surgery. Would you please listen to me? I want the surgery redone. I said, okay, no problem. I'm going to send you off for some tests, and after the tests are done, we can meet again. Now, I don't know about you, but I find reoperative fundoplication to be among the most difficult and potentially dangerous operations I do. And those of you who know me know I do a pretty broad range of surgery. I also work at a tertiary care center, and so I'm on the receiving end of a lot of train wrecks. And if I could say one thing, it's that I wish I'd gotten involved in their care a little bit sooner. So you may or may not agree with me, but I think all these redo fund applications need to be done at a high volume foregut center or tertiary care center. There's just too much to lose. And I can tell you, when someone's had two failed fund applications and their vagus nerves have been injured, it's really, really hard to make them right again. So my plea would be to have those people sent in to very experienced surgeons. To do this surgery right, you've got to take apart all the scar tissue, get things back to the native anatomy the best you can. And in the process of doing that, there's a reasonable possibility you're going to make a perforation in the stomach. And if you don't recognize it, patients, I guarantee you, will get very sick. And same thing with the vagi. You really need to take care of them and preserve it. Similarly, when you get everything sorted out and you redo your fund application, I'm much more likely to use an adjunct technique. Maybe it's a mesh chloroplasty. Maybe it's a collis gastroplasty for esophageal lengthening. But I'm not dogmatic. I don't do it every time. So you need to know when to do it. And when you decide to employ these techniques, you darn well better use them properly, 
or you're going to make things even worse. So it really takes some judgment and experience to get in to uh, get these patients straightened out. And I'd say the other thing about it is I'm always trying to go back and figure out what's different, which reminds me of another one of Dr. Moncure's favorite sayings. He used to tell me, it's a damn fool who gets bit by the same dog twice. So I think what he meant here was, if you do the same operation on the same patient under the same circumstances, you're kidding yourself if you think you're going to get a different result. So let's go back to Mr. Williams for a second. So I did uh, put him through a bunch of tests. The first thing I did, and I always do this, is dig out his old operative note. And then I went back and I got his original upper GI series. And I tried to imagine, with this data, what would I have done differently? And I went ahead and ordered a full set of tests, as I talked about. His upper GI endoscopy showed that he now had three centimeters of uh, Barrett's changes in his distal esophagus. His BMI, in fact, was 35, so, so he was obese. His upper GI series here, you can see that he's got a slipped and a herniated fundoplication with free reflux. His esophageal motility testing showed uh, severely ineffective esophageal motility testing. I did go ahead and uh, get a gastric emptying scan, and happily that was normal, so at least I felt his vagi were intact. And then I called him back uh, to talk to him said, Mr. Williams, I think I can help you. It really doesn't look that bad. He said, great, when can we do it? I said, not so fast. First, I got to ask you a serious question. And then depending on the answer to that, I'm going to give you a job. I said, OK. He said, Mr. Williams, I am going to fix you. So don't take this the wrong way. But if I have to operate on you, I'm all in. I'm going to try to do this laparoscopically. But I'm not leaving the operating room until I've done the very best operation that I can. And so sometimes these situations escalate. And if it was necessary for me to take out one of your ribs and make an incision in your chest and do a big operation that would take you four to six weeks to get over, how about that medical manager? Is that sounding better to you now? He said, no. He said. If it only took me four to six weeks to get better, and I was rid of this awful reflux, I'd do it in a second. I said, good. He said, what's my job? I said, well, I want you to lose about 35 pounds and get down to the weight you were when I first met you. Because at your weight, this redo fund application may not last very long. He said, you know, I've been wanting to do this, and that'll really mo motivate me. I said, great. He said, oh, doc. Before I leave, I've got some questions for you. OK, bring it on, Mr. Williams. He said, I've been hearing these ads on the radio about this new robotic surgery. And I'm just wondering, do you think if you use the robot, it would help me? I said, well, I'd encourage you to get a second opinion. I think it's always good to get a second opinion. They may reinforce what I told you, or maybe someone will see something I hadn't appreciated, and we'll both benefit from that. So I'd actually be more comfortable if you got a second opinion, and I can give you some names to go, good people in town you can go and see. But I've got a little problem. I mean, if you're going to see a surgeon who's advertising for business on the radio because he bought an expensive tool, I'd say buyer beware. So after all, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And he chuckled and winked and told me, I'll see you at the weigh-in, Doc. I'll be back in a few months. So what can we take uh, from this story here? First of all, I think the redo fund applications are difficult, and they need to be done by very experienced surgeons. And most of us that do these are looking for some variable we can change. And so very careful evaluation is important, because if you do the same thing, you really have a very good chance of ending up with the same result unless you can change something. Secondly, I would say that as physicians, we tend to be very hard on ourselves. And we present our complications at m and All of our failures are discussed. We rarely talk about the patient that we operate on. We see once post-op and goes home, and we never hear from them again. So when you have a failure, it's important. If you've done your best and the family appreciates the effort, your communication has been good, 
it's part of the game and you need to sort of get over it and move on. Probably wondered how the Mr. Williams story really did end up. He did lose his 35 pounds and he came back, but he was a little bit nervous. He didn't go get that uh, second opinion that I'd asked him to get. And I remember seeing him in the uh, pre-op area uh, and he was a little shaky, so I sat down and I said, hey, you remember Dr. Monkey? He's the reason that you got here in the first place. He told me something very important. And he said, what's that? He said, and I said, Moncure told me an MGH surgeon doesn't walk on the court to lose. So a couple things. You're going to get my very best shot today, but when you wake up, you're going to be great. <laughs> and he smiled, and you know what? That's exactly how the story ended. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, you know, I, there's so many points in there that, uh, that, that seem to highlight, and, it, and when you talk about the, the trials and tribulations of redo fundoplication surgery, it makes you really want to dwell on the fact that there are no shortcuts at the first operation. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, we all talk about how fast we are or how many cases we can do in a, in a short period of time, but it really, it really seems to me that you've got really one shot to, to do this right without bringing a lot of misery either on your own head or on somebody else's head. So at the, at the first go round, what do you think are your key points that, that you've learned to keep you from having to come back in general? Well, I think the most important point is patient selection. Uh, if you, you have to have a correctable problem and if someone's symptoms are caused by a motility disorder rather than reflux, you're not gonna be too successful. I think technically uh, the most important thing is to make sure that there's no tension on the esophagus, that you've got several centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus, that when you go and construct the fundoplication, it's accurately constructed, that you don't twist it, it's not tense. Uh, and everything else is just basically good surgical technique, I think. I, you know, there, there are no shortcuts, as you say. It, it is, in, a, in one sense, a simple operation, but it's nuanced. Did you, do you uh, scope them on the table do you, to look no. at that fundoplication inside and out? No, I don't. Uh, I understand why some people do. I, I really think when I have done it, I haven't really found a problem. If I'm doing a redo or parasophageal, yes. But straightforwardness, and I, I personally, it's not my practice. So, David, great talk. Um, I noticed in your picture you showed a piece of permanent mesh. What are your thoughts about permanent mesh and hiatal hernia repair? So I... I, I mean, I rarely uh, use it to begin with. I use other techniques, and that was there for illustrative purposes. If I am going to use mesh, uh, in general, I use a, a piece of, okay, I'm going to use a brand name, Pariatex, but it, it coated permanent mesh in that exact configuration, repairing the crura. Um, another way, if you're worried about it, you think there's going to be some erosion, a lot of other times what I would do is cut the right cruise and slide it over, put a relaxing issue in there, and then patch the hole in the cruise, which I'm not even sure you have to do, but I have patched it, and that will move the mesh away from the esophagus. Do you use pledgets routinely? You know, if you go back to somebody who's had pledgets, that could be one of the more annoying parts of taking it all apart, because of all the scar tissue. Always use pledget. I pledget every hiatal stitch, and actually, if I'm doing an issue, I pledget those. I, if I'm using it, doing a toupee, I, I don't. I actually find the pledgets, in a sense, helpful in terms of finding my way on the redos, and especially if you have to take the fun application apart, if you cut right through the pledgets, you're safe. Question here. Uh, how long did it take you? Come, come on over to the microphone, just if, uh, to, to give us, because nobody can hear. It would be so helpful. Uh, how many redos do you offer, Nissan redos, before offering a gastric diversion or a gastric bypass for non-obesity reasons? And the second question is, uh, is there a cutoff BMI where you or the original operation is a gastric diversion for patients with GERD rather than this fund duplication in your practice? Great questions. So my limit on redo fund applications is two. Somebody who comes for a third time redo, 
I generally convert them to a, a high subtotal gastrectomy with Ruan Y bypass, depending on exactly the mode of failure and so forth. Uh, and I also will not do a Nissen on someone whose BMI is 35 or higher. And uh, we discussed that this morning in a session. I, I realize that you can do it in people like that, but I don't. I think Lee Swanstrom told me once, you, you, you get three operations on your esophagus and then you lose it. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, and this is the thing, and these, some of these redos, you'll damage the fundus so much uh, that you may be better off actually doing an esophago gastrectomy, and that's why I, I put in the little vignette about if I had to open your chest and so forth. So, um, Sash Brim from Kalamazoo. When you do redo, uh, do you do the same primary procedure like if you do redo Nissen or you go to Tupé or Dor? Any differences? Right. I, I think it varies uh, highly by the patient and what the current data you're presented with. Um, some people can go on to develop secondary achalasia or severe motility disorders, and that becomes an important part of their symptom complex, in which case I would do a toupee. But most of the time, if they had a Nissen, they had it because they had esophagitis, a real bad GERD, and I would just redo the Nissen if I could. Do you have any particular tricks for preserving the vagi on the, on the redos? Find it high. Dissect. Um, you know, when you start off and you just you usually have to get the left lobe of the liver, left lateral segments of the liver off, and then you can get into the hiatus, and it, you can always tell how far up the previous surgeon went, and you can get into an undissected plane, and then I find them and follow it down. You generally won't injure them going up. It's you injure them when you start to take the fundoplication apart and everything's scarred together. You, show, you mentioned on uh, this patient some esophageal dysmotility, and uh, I know that the pendulum has swung on this. It used to be that if you had significant dysmotility, a lot of people would do a partial fundoplication. It seems like that's utilized less now. Your thoughts on kind of how you look at that motility and judge what operation you're going to do? Yeah, I mean, I would go primarily by the patient's symptoms. Um, it's just I think you'd like to have all the data that you can and, and sort of look at it in aggregate rather than in isolation for each specific thing. And, I'm not trying to dodge your question, but if the patient didn't have dysphagia, even with that test, and they wanted a Nissen, I'd redo the Nissen, to be honest with you. And, and if you had found that there was poor gastric emptying, which is certainly makes reflux worse, how would that uh, change your choices? I would be more likely actually to do a partial fundoplication for fear of, of bloating. Um, I've had really checkered results in those situations with adding a pyloroplasty. Sometimes it's been helpful, sometimes it just hasn't. And uh, that's why I say, if you get someone who's got a failed fundoplication and a vagal nerve injury together, it's very hard to make them right. And sometimes the best thing for them actually is a resection and RUI. That's great. Mr. Rat? Well, round of applause for Dr. Ratner.